The next item of business is a member's debate on motion number 246, the name of Clare Hockey, on the increase in trade union membership in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible? And I call on Clare Hockey to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As an active trade union and formerly a divisional convener with Unison, it's particularly satisfying to open this uh, debate welcoming the recent increase in trade union membership in Scotland. The trade union movement has a proud history of protecting workers' rights, born out of a desire to combat exploitation and to ensure a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. The rapid growth in mass industrial workplaces in the 19th century provided great wealth to those who sought to develop the new industries of the Industrial Revolution, be that textiles, iron, coal, steel, and the onset of mass manufacturing. These new industries were labour intensive and being mostly based in larger towns and cities drew much of their labour from a changing agricultural population. All over Europe and Britain, people were moving Towns and cities were growing and goods were being manufactured to feed the expansion of empires. However, whilst great wealth was being created for some, life was often cheap. Poor working conditions prevailed and injury and death in factories and mines were commonplace. Who could forget accidents on the scale of the Blantyre explosion in 1877 in my own constituency, where at least 215 men and boys perished? Indeed, the scale and frequency of mining and other industrial accidents across Scotland and Britain during that era was horrific. It was from this background of poor pay, poor conditions and disregard for the value of workers' lives that the first workers' cooperatives and unions grew. However, every stage of the trade union movement's development was to prove a struggle. As the number of trade-based unions grew, supporting members who exercised their right to withdraw their labour for fair treatment, so gradually pay terms and conditions improved. The legacy of those hard-won benefits remain with us. Trade unions and collective bargaining have given us many of the benefits which are now so often taken for granted. A standard working day with paid breaks, the minimum wage, pay for overtime, paid holidays and public holidays, sick pay, paid maternity and recently paid mater uh, paternity leave, the right to withdraw your labour when in dispute, and the right to representation. If you just let me carry on just a wee bit more, thanks. Uh, one of the greatest achievements of the trade union movement was ensuring the basic right of a safe place to work. Health and safety at work legislation would not be as rigorous as it is today without the work and sacrifice of trade union members over the past 130 years. Of course, terrible accidents can still occur. And I would in particular ask Parliament to be mindful of the approaching 28th anniversary of the Piper Alpha disaster on July the 6th. Does the member want to? Neil Finlay. The member listed a whole uh, range of benefits that have been introduced um, but, um, through pressure from the trade unions. Does she, um, will she take the opportunity to congratulate the Labour governments who have brought in almost all of these things? Right. Clear hockey. I think I'll move on from that point, Mr uh, Finlay. At its peak in 1979, trade union membership in the UK stood in excess of 13 million, double the current figures. Of course, the industrial landscape has changed and those traditional industries I have mentioned have sadly declined, a decline that was outrageously mismanaged by the Thatcher government in the 1980s, with the underlying objective of undermining the trade union movement. The shift to, mo to more service-based economies has given us new high turnover workplaces. There are also challenges there with the increase in part-time part work and zero-hour contracts. These modern workplaces are more difficult to organise in and are notoriously resistant to trade union recognition. Nonetheless, employees in these workplaces also benefit from the entitlements won by historic trade union pressure. So whilst overall trade union membership is down significantly since 1979, it is pleasing to see the recent increase, particularly in Scotland. The recent, recently published statistical bulletin from the UK Department of Business, Industry and Skills on trade union membership shows a rise of 42,000 members in Scotland from 688,000 to 730,000. That's just over 6% rise between 2000, uh, 2014 and 2015. There are some interesting and welcoming points in its key findings. That women are more likely to be trade union members than men. 
that in the teeth of Tory cuts, public sector membership is up. Private sector membership has increased for the fifth successive year. A trade union presence in the workplace is higher in Scotland than in the UK as a whole, and employees in Scotland and Wales are more likely to be trade union members than workers in England. There are, however, also some points of concern. Older workers account for a higher proportion of members, with 39% of uh, membership over the age of 50. Full-time employees are more likely to be members than part-time ones, and middle-income earners more likely to be members than lower-paid er earners. Presiding officer, trade union membership in post-industrial Scotland is as relevant and beneficial today as it was in the past. However, all the achievements I have listed are now under the threat from the current Tory government, UK the current Tory UK government's proposed trade union legislation, which I am proud to see this SNP government and our SNP MPs in Westminster, with the support of this parliament and the STUC, have pledged to resist. This totally unnecessary legislation is a threat to the fundamental rights of workers and threatens to undermine Scotland's approach to industrial relations. There is no evidence to support the need for this legislation and the UK Government has made no attempt to consider its impact in Scotland and in particular on our public services. Whilst the Tories have been forced into various concessions as the Bill has progressed due to strong opposition from SNP MPs and the Scottish Government, this is still a regressive and vindictive piece of legislation which will undermine the positive employee-employer relationships we currently enjoy in Scotland. The achievements of the trade unions are also endangered by the threat of a leave vote in next week's EU referendum. Many of the employment benefits we currently enjoy were enhanced and underpinned by EU legislation. I would therefore urge trade union members across Scotland and the UK to vote Remain to ensure these benefits are not eroded by current and future Tory governments. I am proud of the relationship this government has fostered with the unions and the STUC to ensure we deliver a fairer deal for the workers in Scotland. Unlike the Tories in Westminster, this government does not see trade unions as the opposition or the enemy, but rather our partners in delivering a fair work agenda. Scotland's proud trade union heritage is no longer the preserve of any one party. It belongs to all of us, regardless of the sector or demographic. The benefits of trade union membership have helped lead the foundation for us to work together to take Scotland forward. I believe we should encourage employees in all workplaces to join a union, especially younger employees. Strong, constructive trade unions are an essential element of a successful nation. They play a vital role in protecting workers' rights, fighting for fair pay and building a better society. And that is why I very much welcome this increasing trend in union membership. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey. Point of order. Thank you, President. Officer. I wonder if you could clarify if this Parliament is in Purda for the EU referendum? I'll uh, reflect on what was said during that, and I'll come back to on that case. Yes, we're in Purda, but I didn't notice anything in the speech that breached that, but I will reflect on it with the other presiding officers. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by David Torrens. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate Claire Hockey on securing this debate on trade union membership? Let me declare my interest as a member of the GMB and Unison. I am, of course, wholeheartedly in favour of trade unions and the important role they play in advancing rights in the workplace and delivering social and economic change across the country. You know, whether it's defending the rights of an individual or collective bargaining for a workplace or influencing civic society or indeed influencing government policy and action, trade unions contribute hugely to the well-being of our country. I'm pleased, therefore, to see that trade union membership has increased by 42,000, taking that total up to 730,000 in Scotland. We've also noted similar increases in the East and West Midlands as well as the South East of England. Unions are as important now as they ever were. People join trade unions for a whole myriad of reasons. You're likely to be paid 8% more if you're in a union than not for comparable jobs. You're twice as likely to be low paid if you're not in a trade union. Your job security is better. Non-union firms are two and a half times as likely to sack workers. And you get fair treatment and representation should things go wrong. And whilst their primary focus is of course on their members and their workplaces, 
Unions are about so much more than that. Yes, it's a voice at the workplace, but it's also about improving lives for the families, their communities, and the country too. In every part of life, trade unions make a difference. They are, I think, at their best when they're organisations that are campaigning for economic and social justice. You only need to look at the Better Than Zero campaign organised by young trade unionists, supported by the STUC, to see the truth in that. Because those young trade unionists are taking on the issues of insecure work and low pay for young people across Scotland. And I commend their work to the Parliament. And of course, we can't forget the role that trade unions played in shaping this Parliament through the Constitutional Convention. And we are grateful to them for that too. But I want to pick up on two issues raised in the STUC comment about the debate we're having this evening. They are right to challenge us to do more than simply offer warm words. There are issues with procurement where time after time the Scottish Government rejected amendments to the procurement bill from the Labour benches about issues like companies that blacklisted employees, about paying the living wage, about equal pay and more besides. Here was an opportunity to make a practical difference to workers across Scotland engaged in delivering £10 billion of public contracts each year. But I regret to say, presiding officer, it was an opportunity missed. The STUC points to employers who actively prevent trade unions from recruiting. Surely we should not be awarding huge public sector contracts to those companies who are anti-union. And I would be very grateful if the Minister would take that away to consider. Um, I regret the musterings from some of his colleagues behind him. But finally, I am aware of the restrictions placed on members when com commenting about the EU referendum, but let me make the following observation. Trade unions working across Europe have with member governments fought for and secured a package of workplace rights that have improved conditions across Europe. Maternity rights, paternity rights, right for part-time workers and much more besides. Let's remember that when we consider what we do on the 23rd of June. Can I apologise, presiding officer, to you and the chamber for leaving early as I have a cross-party group to chair. But let me finish by again congratulating Claire Hockey on bringing this debate to Parliament. But unlike her, I will pay tribute to successive Labour governments who, in partnership with trade unions, have delivered rights for workers across the country um, in the past and will do so in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. David Torrance, we're followed by Liam Kerr. Four minutes, please, Mr Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank Claire Hockey for bringing up this motion in Chamber today to welcome an increase in the trade union membership in Scotland and the support of its continued growth. Throughout history, trade unions have played an important part in employees' rights and have successfully adapted to immense political and social changes. For decades, trade unions have served as arenas for open communication and bargaining to promote development, not only in the economic sphere, through industrial organisation and wage negotiation, but especially in the social sphere, with the promotion of workers' rights and responsibilities. I would like to congratulate the immense progress trade unions have made in recent years in achieving a significant increase in membership from 688,000 in 2014 to 730,000 in 2015. I would also like to recognise that salaries for trade union members are 8 per cent higher than non-members, and I encourage this progress to continue in the future, despite some economic hardships that Scotland may face. Most of my working life was spent in much of manufacturing as an engineer, so it was only natural that you became a member of a GMB trade union. Many of the changes to working practices and conditions within the sector over the last 20 years have been attributed to the constant pressure from trade unions, especially GMB. In my last 10 years within manufacturing, I had the privilege to become a shop steward in the GMB. And can I say, pride, presiding officer, it was one of the most rewarding experiences being able to assist and help your fellow members. There is a lot at stake for trade union members on June the 23rd. I commend the support that the European Union has given workers in initiating legislation as enhanced employment protection, especially for part-time, temporary and migrant workers. I cannot stress enough that my, as migration has increased, unemployment in Scotland has decreased. The EU has played a crucial role in implementing legislation on paid annual holidays, 
improving health and safety protection, right to unpaid parental leave, the right to equal treatment to protect working people from exploitation and discrimination. The future of workers in the EU UK lies partly in a positive development in EU employment law. And I encourage UK trade unions to continue to work hand in hand with their European partners to build alliances to advance their social and political objectives. We also need to take economic consequences into consideration. The EU membership ensures us to the European Court of Justice and other human rights institutions. Without the protection of the EU, the security of workers' rights of thousands of UK citizens could be eroded. We live in a society where there are more working women, yet they are more likely to be paid less and often without a guarantee that their job is secure. Therefore, I praise the work trade unions have carried out to recognise the extremely important part women play to ensure equal opportunities, not only in the workplace, but also ensuring that women have access to work. Women now make up the majority of trade union membership, and the gap between male and female employment is at its lowest ever, especially in comparison to the rest of the UK. I also commend offshore unions, Unite, RMT, GMB, and Natalis for creating the offshore coordinating group as a quick response to the collapse of oil prices since 2014, which has had a devastating consequences for the oil and gas workforce. Since its establishment, the OCG has been extremely successful in coordinating campaigns for safety conditions, policy development and job security to ensure that trade unions make a positive contribution to achieving the UK and Scottish Government's objective of maximising economic recovery. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would once again like to thank Claire for securing this debate in Parliament today. The voice of a trade union should not be ignored, and I encourage the Scottish and UK Government employers, regulators and agencies to listen. The existence and strength of a trade union is vital for society in stimulating communication between workers and management, in providing advice and support to avoid major conflict, and most of all, in representing employees who do not, as individuals, have a voice. Thank you very much. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And let me also begin by thanking Claire Hockey for putting down this motion. Uh, I'm sure she'll forgive me for focusing on supporting the motion laid down rather than the wider debate uh, brought in on UK proposals. I appreciate Claire Hockey may be feeling rather uncomfortable at the moment hearing that the Scottish Conservatives are supporting her motion on trade union membership. But my reasons for supporting the motion are a response to misconceptions about both the political leanings and end games of both the union movement and the Scottish Conservatives. The commonly held caricature of trade unionists is not one I recognise, nor have I really seen in my extensive dealings with them in over a decade practicing oil and gas uh, employment law in the oil and gas sector. I do not accept that most people join a union because they are particularly political or indeed of the hard left. On the contrary, I agree that the union movement is built on and was built by the workers. Hardworking people who believed and still believe that there must be a floor of job security and workers' rights. The counterbalance to the unfettered ability of an employer to source labour at the lowest price. And the modern union movement is so much more. Not only does it campaign for workers' rights, but it plays a vital role defending health and safety in the workplace, ensuring vital representation for employees at discipline and grievances, and training their members to be more productive, better at what they do, providing advice on everything from safety, pensions, and CPD. And that training is considerable. And I can say from personal experience that some, if not most, of my form most formidable and impressive opponents down the years have been the regional organisers. And let's not forget that the motion talked of membership increasing in specific areas. 55% of the union members in 2015 were women, up from 45% some 20 years ago. The proportion aged above 50 is increasing, and around 30% of union members are professionals. As always, those who have the least voice are being given one by this movement. And that, I think, we can all celebrate. Hardworking people, encouraging trade opportunities, people working together in communities and groups to represent themselves and give people a voice. These are Scottish Conservative values. It was Mrs Thatcher who cut the basic rate of tax from 33 to 25% to ensure all workers could keep a higher proportion of wages. It was today's Conservative Party with its long-term economic plan, which has brought in the national living wage, a mandatory rise, which will reach over £9 per hour that has lifted those learning less than £11,000 a year out of income tax altogether. 
Not on four minutes, I'm sorry. All this while increasing childcare provision south of the border, encouraging a renewed focus on apprenticeships and slashing unemployment to its lowest level ever. Now, there are many who would claim the union movement as a labor creation, but people often forget that it was the original One Nation Tory, Benjamin Disraeli, who initially gave workers the right to sue companies if they broke employment contracts and allowed picketing. It was he who so memorably said, power has only one duty, to improve the social welfare of the people. Mrs. Thatcher herself held her first political office within conservative trade unionists and created 250 branches across the country. In Scotland in 2015, it was the Scottish Conservatives who called for the Scottish Government to use the business rate system to incentivise firms prepared to pay a living wage. So yes, we support Clare Hockey's motion. The Scottish Conservatives welcome the increase in membership. We agree that the trade unions play and have played an invaluable role in Scottish society and we look forward to them continuing to do so. Thank you very much. I call Richard Leonard, followed by Patrick Harvey and Neil Finlay, who will be the last speaker. Mr Le Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I also want to congratulate Claire Hockey uh, for placing this motion before us. Claire Hockey is a member of the SNP and a Unison activist. I am a GMB Union member, a Unite the Union member, and of course a member of the Labour Party. And in light of her comments, I was uh, uh, reflecting on the fact that when I first joined the Transport and General Workers Union in 1985, the Tory MP Peter Bottomley was often in the union's publicity, reminding us that you could be a Tory and a trade union member even during the Thatcher era. Although to Liam Kerr I say, I'm not quite sure that the workers at GCHQ or the National Union of Mine Workers would recognise his description of Margaret Thatcher as being trade union friendly. I also recall that Walter Osborne, uh, who was a Liberal Party member, took his union, the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, to court, leading to the infamous Osborne judgment by the House of Lords in 1909, which gagged the trade union movement for three years, leading James Keir Hardy to reflect, uh, with the trade unions gagged, one class can make the law, the other cannot. Which leads me to make this point. Anyone who believes that trade unions don't need a political voice just needs to look at the Trade Union Act 2016. Politics is a legitimate concern of trade unions because places like this parliament determine the social and economic framework which unions function in. The Trade Union Act is a shadow of its original form but still carries with it profound questions like is it right for the government of the day to deploy the whole apparatus of the state, the UK Parliament, the judiciary and the courts, a certification officer with new powers of inspection, even the police, to wage an attack on working people's ability to organise both to defend themselves and to advance their interests. And for the avoidance of doubt, this legislation is not, in my view, anti-Scottish, it is anti-working class, which is why I hold the view that we should stop separating people on the basis of nationality and start uniting them on the basis of class. The imposition of a 50% turnout rule uh, and an additional 40% support requirement for workers in health, education, fire, transport, nuclear decommissioning and border security stays too. This is not a matter of trade union administration or procedure, it is an attack on the basic universal human right to withdraw your labour. So it is a moral question at its root about what kind of society we live in. Many of the concessions around notice for industrial action, extensions to ballot mandates, even the check-off facility still require agreement from an employer. So my question this afternoon uh, to the minister is this, what is your instruction to those parts of that state apparatus uh, for which you have responsibility, including Police Scotland and the judiciary, and secondly, in those devolved parts of the public sector for which you have responsibility as an employer, how will you stand up against any move to crack down on trade union facility time? How will you stand up to maintain check-off arrangements? Because if we are to see the growth and flourishing of trade unions in Scotland in future years, we need to know the answer uh, to these questions. Finally, it was Aniron Bevan who said that the job of a Labour MP is not, and I quote, to plead mercy for the poor, but to get political power for the masses. So I firmly believe that real democracy will not be won 
Radical inequalities will not be ended. The good society will not be built without strong trade unions and a major redistribution of power from the owners of wealth to the creators of it. And I hope on that we can agree. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I uh, draw members' attention to my register of interest, which uh, notes that I'm an associate member of the NUJ. And while it's not a registrable interest, I should also just put on record the fact that my party is very happily a tenant of the STUC at their building uh, in Glasgow. I want to recognise not only the historic, but also the continuing role uh, of trade unions as many other members have. It's very clear from the evidence, not just in this country, but around the world, that at periods of high levels of trade union membership, and in a framework of strong trade union rights, we see greater economic equality in society. We see a smaller proportion of the national wealth hoarded by those who need it the least, and a greater proportion of it uh, coming into the, the pay packets uh, of people on, on ordinary salaries and, and ordinary incomes. That's what we should be seeking to achieve, and we should be under no illusion we won't be able to build that more equal society without an important role being played by the trade union movement. And um, you know, unlike others, I, I will give recognition and credit where it's due uh, to the actions of previous UK, governments, uh, UK Labour governments, uh, as Neil Finlay suggested, uh, in building the Labour movement. Uh, and I hope that he would agree with me uh, that it would have been desirable also if the Labour government in the 1990s had reversed some of the anti-trade union legislation of the Thatcher era, uh, I think that's perhaps some, something that we might also agree on. That agenda of undermining those trade union rights still continues. The Trade Union Act, uh, as Mr. Mr. Leonard just uh, mentioned, passed by the UK Parliament this year, betrayed the desire of the Conservative Party to continue undermining the rights of people to organise together. And I was dismayed, but not at all surprised, I have to say, to hear Mr Kerr use this debate, use this debate to defend the UK government's divisive policies, such as the sham living wage, which will only increase labour exploitation of younger workers, and which I have never heard defended by any trade union. And whatever the result next week, I don't intend to stray over the line, Deputy Presiding Officer, but whatever the I result... I thank you for that. Whatever the result next week, there are, these are still the people in power at UK level. And those of us who want a, stray, a strong trade union movement and to defend the rights of trade unions to act collectively, we must act together, overcoming the distrust which too often exists between political parties in Scotland if we want to act together on that. And there are other actions we can take in Scotland as well. SNP members know that I give credit where it's due for the Fair Work Agenda and for the Business Pledge, but both need to go further. In particular, there's a need for greater conditionality in the Fair Work Agenda. Along with employers which pay poverty wages or exploit their employees with zero-hour contracts, along with those who use tax havens, along with those with a poor environmental record, we should also say clearly that those employers that refuse to acknowledge and work with trade unions when their employees wish to join one should not have access to publicly funded support services, grants and loans. It's not, as a previous heckler was suggesting, rubbish to say that companies such as Amazon have enjoyed such support in the past. They should be denied it in the future. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do wish that Scotland was able to legislate for itself to restore rights which have been taken away from the trade union movement. But until then, we must use every power that we do have. We should do more than give speeches about the value that trade unions create in our society. We should be listening to their views on the decisions that we take here, and we should be opposing in every way possible those employers who refuse to build strong and respectful relationships with the trade unions which represent their employees. Thank you very much. And I call uh, Neil Finlay, last speaker, four minutes, please. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. Officer, can I declare my membership of Unite the Union and the EIS? Uh, I uh, welcome this motion being brought to Parliament. I just wish that we would have been allowed to debate the UK Government Trade Union Bill and that this Parliament would have had the opportunity to vote on it. But sadly and wrongly, in my opinion, that opportunity was denied us. Uh, Clare Hockey 
Uh, I, I welcome the fact that she's brought this uh, before us. She raised the issue of the SNP's opposition to the trade union bill. I welcome any opposition to that bill, which is now uh, passed through Parliament. But the re reality is that it was campaigning outside of Parliament by trade unions and others, a broad coalition of people, and by Labour members in the House of Lords that got rid of the worst aspects of that bill. Now, trade unions are a force for good in society. All of the major progressive social and economic policies that have been introduced over the last century and more have been supported and more often than not driven by the Labour and trade union movement. Early trade unions campaigned to end the Combination Acts, the, that ban on collective organisation, promoted the People's Charter, the original People's Charter, the right to universal male suffrage at that point, and then later votes for women. They achieved reductions in the working week, factories legislation, pensions, sick pay, holiday pay, weekends, time off, maternity pay, health and safety at work, and all the rest of it. And they've played a key role in fighting fascism and supporting anti-racism campaigns, whether that be in Cable Street or Bar Barkin and Dagenham or Chile or apartheid South Africa. And this and more was achieved and driven, all of that, by the Labour and trade union movement. And almost all of those key progressive workplace policies were introduced by Labour governments, advancing the cause on rights and rights of my class. And Patrick Harvey asked me to condemn or comment, at least, on the Labour government in the 1990s, and that it should have done more. Of course it should have done more. I said it then, and I've said it many times since. But wouldn't it be novel, wouldn't it be novel if anyone on the government benches in this place gave any critique of any policy of the Scottish Government? Let's see if it happens in this Parliament, because it most certainly did not in the last one. So we can see in so many ways that we've all benefited from trade union campaign and actions and victories. People have mentioned that trade unions earn more, women earn more, uh, private sector unions earn more than non-members. That is all to the good. But if the government truly believes that unionised workplaces are safer, happier and more productive, then we have to see concrete action to increase union membership. And if they do that, they will have our absolute support. We welcome the fair work agenda, but it has to be real, with real commitment and action on the ground to bring about change. So what practical initiatives are we seeing to help trade unions recruit members? Do we see, for example, Scottish uh, government departments actively and proactively encouraging uh, regular trade union recruitment initiatives, going out of their way to facilitate them? Does the Scottish government make it clear to agencies and public funded bodies that they should be helping facilitate that recruitment process? Do we put conditions on the award of business grants, like Patrick Harvey mentioned, that would promote collective bargaining or unionisation? I checked today, um, Richard Leonard mentioned it earlier in the debate, 272 businesses out of over 300,000 have signed the business pledge, a tiny, tiny proportion. The vast majority of those businesses are not unionised. Now, I welcome that they've signed it, but it is a drop in the ocean. And can I say that employee forums, staff associations, toolbox talks, team meetings, intranet sites, all of that is no replacement for trade union representation or free collective bargaining. So, presiding officer, I welcome uh, the increase in trade union membership. I would caveat that by saying that density in Wales and Northern Ireland are higher than in Scotland. Uh, uh, we should all be doing what we can to increase membership uh, in Scotland and indeed across the UK and as an internationalist, I would say across the world too. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. Now call on Jamie Hepburn to wind up, please. Minister, seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by thanking uh, Claire Hockey, joining other members, and thanking Claire Hockey for bringing forward this, uh, her first uh, members debate to highlight the uh, valued and important role that trade unions have in making our workplaces fairer, uh, and more innovative, more productive uh, and better places uh, to work. Uh, we have uh, heard today many examples of where unions have not only changed the lives of individual workers who have been treated unfairly, but also uh, where they have been instrumental in uh, protecting the pay in people's pockets, where they have made uh, strides and improvements to 
to work. Uh, safety Claire Hockey referred to the uh, Blanter explosion of uh, 1877 as a uh, representative of a, a former mining area. Uh, I know how deep the uh, scars uh, still run of such uh, industrial uh, accidents. Uh, we have, of course, seen uh, massive improvements to health and safety in uh, the workplace in the intervening period, uh, largely because of the pressure applied by uh, trade unions. Of course, uh, tragedies still occur, but they are thankfully uh, much rarer uh, than they once uh, were. Neil Finlay uh, also rightly spoke of the uh, international reach of uh, the trade union uh, movement. We have uh, seen that here in Scotland in the past. He referred to uh, the situation in uh, Chile in the uh, 1970s. Of course, uh, we uh, can think of the action that was taken by uh, workers at Rolls-Royce uh, in East Kilbride, uh, reaching out to those who were facing uh, repression in uh, Latin America. Unions have uh, shown uh, real leadership to work to protect jobs when the economic climate is uh, uh, brought to the horizon of uh, closures or uh, redundancies. We've seen uh, recent examples of that activity and that activity uh, bearing uh, fruit. When Ferguson's uh, shipyard was threatened with closure, many uh, gave it a uh, little chance of uh, survival. The, uh, this government set up uh, a task force with uh, trade unions playing a pivotal role. Two years on, uh, Ferguson's has not only survived but is now winning orders, including uh, public contracts, and there are plans for the workforce to increase uh, tenfold. The shipyard has uh, also taken on new apprentices and investment both in the future of the yard and in our uh, young people and unions played uh, a critical role in allowing that to happen. More recently, uh, the Scottish Steel Task Force has succeeded in, and I know this will have real relevance to Claire Hockey because it affects uh, her uh, constituency, but it succeeded in finding a uh, buyer for the two uh, threatened uh, steel plants at uh, DL and uh, Clyde Bridge through out that uh, process, this uh, government worked uh, closely with uh, the community uh, union. Uh, this shows that uh, when government, industry and trade unions work together, we can uh, achieve real uh, results. And uh, Our shared values and uh, goals are set out in a memorandum of understanding with the STUC, which uh, captures our uh, commitment to a partnership working on uh, strategic uh, issues. Uh, I thought it was... Of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful. I'm sure we can all welcome that general sentiment. But I, I'm keen to understand the position of the government on a point of principle. Does the minister agree that it shouldn't be up to employers to decide whether or not to recognise a trade union? It should be up to the employees there to decide whether they choose to organise in that way. Don't, doesn't the minister accept that employers should have a responsibility to recognise and work with unions if their employees wish to form one or join one? I think, Minister? Making, I think the point I was making is it's much better when we have that environment and clearly employers have a critical role uh, to play in that regard in allowing uh, trade unions to have uh, the uh, full capacity to organise uh, on uh, the basis of allowing uh, workers to freely associate with one another. Uh, now clearly, and I was going to make the point later, and I maybe will uh, re-emphasise this point in uh, a slightly different context, but I very much agree with the point that Patrick Harvey it made, I think it would be rather better of this. The legislature had a significant more leeway and discretion in exercising legislative competence than we do, and we might be able to actually influence these things rather better than we do. But in the general sense of the terms he's laid out, I'm very happy to say that through our partnership working with trade unions, I think it is very important that workers are allowed the capacity to come together on a, a collective basis. I was going to turn to the comments of, of Liam Kerr because I, we do operate a, a partnership approach and I thought it, it was very telling uh, to hear him and uh, it's maybe slightly unfair uh, to do it, but I'll, I'll do it nonetheless anyway, uh, presiding uh, officer, because I'm picking up on a, what was a, a, a brief uh, remark uh, by Mr Kerr, but he said that many of his most formidable opponents have been uh, trade uh, unions, and I don't doubt that that's probably uh, true, but I think it does speak uh, somewhat of uh, a, a mindset, a certain uh, mindset. This uh, administration doesn't view our trade unions uh, colleagues as opponents, but as valued partners. And of course, having named them, Liam I'm Kerr. happy to give way to Mr. Uh, Kerr. Uh, just to, as, as a point to make, as an employment lawyer, principally acting for companies, 
uh, the regional organisers were typically my opponents, so I meant no slight by the uh, wording I used. Minister. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have facilitated the opportunity for Mr Kerr to clarify uh, his uh, remarks, but he might forgive uh, my uh, previous cynicism uh, have on terms of uh, the general uh, outlook that many of us hold in relation to uh, the general uh, Conservative position in relation to uh, trade uh, unions and trade unionists. As a, an administration, we uh, recognise that the STUC and trade unions are uh, vital partners in taking forward our uh, vision for uh, a wealthier and fairer uh, Scotland. Graeme Smith uh, set out a, a statement today welcoming uh, the approach we take uh, here as a government to uh, trade uh, unions. And I believe that it's this spirit of cooperation that has in uh, some way contributed to the increase in uh, trade union uh, membership uh, in Scotland uh, over uh, the years 2014 to 2015. Uh, and I thought it was interesting to see that increase in, in membership. It was rather in stark uh, contrast to the context, the figures of the overall decline over the last uh, four uh, decades. Now, I'm coming up against time, but I'm sure I've got a little bit if of If you want to miss so a little time, hand, Joanne Lamont. Yes. I wonder if you regard yourself as opposing the trade unions when your government resisted the idea that people benefiting from public contracts should pay the living wage, or indeed that organisations that exploit their workforce, like Amazon, shouldn't, accept, shouldn't be given government grants. Is that opposing or supporting the position of the trade unions? Minister? Well, what I was, because this has been picked up by a, a number of members, and perhaps they're a, a little behind the times, because, of course, what we have uh, done is we've uh, uh, set out uh, statutory uh, guidance in the selection of tenders and award uh, contracts addressing fair work practices, including uh, the living wage uh, in uh, uh, procurement. We've also uh, laid down uh, regulations in relation to uh, the concerns. I know that Mr Finlay, sitting right next to uh, Ms Lamont, has uh, done uh, a lot of work in raising concerns around blacklisting. We've laid down uh, regulations in relation to uh, how uh, companies that have been found to have been guilty of the practice of a blacklisting can be prohibited from a public a contract. So there has been some. I work think I must allow the minister to wind up. Under way. I think I'm be told to wind up, Mr. Finlay. Of course, be happy to speak to you at any time about any of uh, these uh, matters. I do want to finish uh, just referring to the the trade union uh, bill, uh, President Officer. I am uh, delighted that uh, the opposition of uh, this administration, others in uh, other legislatures, and primarily, of course, the trade union movement itself has led to uh, some concessions by the UK government. I don't think they go uh, far enough. I have to say again, with respect to uh, Mr Kerr, uh, you know, we don't perhaps have misconceptions of the Conservative Party in relation to uh, trade unions out of nowhere. Uh, when we see uh, a trade union uh, bill that is nothing short of an attack on the right of uh, Labour to organise itself, uh, these misconceptions don't come from anywhere. We have set out our opposition to that uh, bill. I think it would be better, of course, a uh, presiding officer of this uh, legislature had a greater uh, leeway, greater control uh, on a legislative basis over these matters. Sadly, we do not. Uh, and short of that uh, circumstances, I look forward to Scotland's unions continuing their role in representing their members' interests and their continued partnership working with this government to advance the Fair Work Agenda. Uh, thank you, Minister. That concludes this debate and I close this.